Hi guys, Functional Medicine of Idaho here, um, doing a wonderful discussion on the current happenings with the COVID-19 virus and what our recommendations are. I'm here with Dr. Mark Holthouse, our uh, medical director, and Tom Malter, our director of nutrition education. Um, I'm Amber Warren, I'm a PA in the clinic, and I'm here to discuss um, with these brilliant minds um, what we're doing um, in our community and really what we're trying to preach worldwide. So um, please welcome these guys. Um, we kind of just want to start off with a quick intro on what this virus is. So guys, take it away. Yeah, I'll start a little bit and then uh, Tom, Tom lets you wax eloquent here. I know you're really prepared. I'm, I'm excited to learn a little bit of that too. I, what I know about this is that it's a coronavirus. It's a zoonotic infection, meaning that it comes from animals and it gets transferred to humans. And it's not certainly the first time we've seen these. We've seen infection outbreaks like this in 2002 with SIRS, where we had you know, a 9% mortality rate, which is very, very high. And then 2012, we had the MERS version, both coronaviruses, which had somewhere around 34% mortality. So really, really high mortality. My understanding, and Tom, you can correct me if you've seen something more recent, because this thing's changing every hour is we're somewhere south of 1% mortality, about 0.7 with the current coronavirus. So it's novel, it's new, it's a mutation. It's very different than what we saw in 2009 with H1N1, you all remember that. And that was a flu, an influenza, a novel flu virus that really was kind of here and then gone. And you think, wow, what happened to that? It was, it was a quick transient thing. And, the difference was it was a flu virus, and we, we understand flu viruses a little bit better. We were able to develop a vaccine very, very quickly and get updated and, and get people vaccinated. Passive immunization occurred, and we did some, not, it really didn't even get to this point of having to institute this massive social isolation uh, because we saw the, the peak, the epi curve was very, very different. And so it was gone almost before the thing started. Uh, nobody really knows how this is going to affect us relative to a flu because it's new. But all the hype and the closing of public sector meetings is strictly aimed at one thing. And that is to lower this epi curve, which is the number of new cases over time and we're trying to basically decrease the number of deaths in our older patients and patients that have chronic diseases, which is a whole bunch of the population as we're gonna talk about. So we're trying to flatten that curve so we decrease the number of deaths from this. We're not gonna stop this outbreak. Um, I think those of you who have been listening to the news from reputable sources, there's just no way to prevent the spread of this. What we can do is try to mitigate the mortality, and that's really what we're about. So that's to set things off. Tom, I know you've got a lot. Well, let's, let's just support what you're talking about, because that's plenty. When you peruse the net and you look at people who are experts in virology and vaccines and whatnot, I, I ran across Paul Offit, who's been you know, a counsel to senators and uh, a lot of people who are making policy on vaccine and infectious disease. And, um, you know, he's, he's usually extremely conservative about things, you know, like, hey, get your vaccine, make sure you're protected, make sure, make sure. This is what Dr. Paul Offit had to say about this in regards to influenza, which I, I really appreciated. It said, which will do more harm, the virus or the fear of the virus? <laughs> Why are we so scared of the novel coronavirus COVID-19? People are usually scared of viruses for three reasons. One, the virus causes gruesome, disfiguring, permanent symptoms like smallpox, for example, not only caused lifelong facial scarring, it also was a frequent cause of blindness in those who survived. Or two, the virus has a prede uh, predilection for children, like polio paralyzed tens of thousands of young children every year until a vaccine was finally established. Or three, the virus is likely to kill you. So rabies virus virtually kills 100% of people, right? So uh, the novel coronavirus currently circulating in the US the one that causes us to shut down schools, restaurants, sporting events, and virtually every aspect of our culture falls into none of these categories. Nonetheless, people are scared, really scared. The reason they think that if they catch COVID-19, 
they have a high likelihood of dying from the disease. Most public health officials have done little to lessen this fear, arguing that people are 10 times more likely to die from this novel coronavirus virus than influenza. Unfortunately, these officials haven't made clear the difference between relative risk and absolute risk. Mm -hmm. Although people are more likely to die from COVID-19 than they are from influenza, they are far more likely to catch influenza. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they are far more likely to die from influenza. So I took that and I was like, you know, this is a person who dives into the literature every single day, is into virology, uh, really knows about infectious disease, and, and is saying, you know, what are we doing here, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're considering the fact that every time a new expert comes out or a new report comes out or a new, you know, pocket of illness comes out and we look at the percentage of deaths in that particular region, in that particular population, we're not paying attention to how old those people are. We're not paying attention to the fact that testing is not very good at this point. And we're not testing the vast majority of people. I mean, you look at South Korea, the death rates were lower than, than what we're hearing in the news. Why? Because they tracked every single person who ever got diagnosed and did extensive testing and made sure everybody that was around them who got exposed got testing and was in quarantine. You know, there are, there are different steps you can do to minimize the spread of this, mind you, but you're never going to stop it, just like you said. Now, what I really want to do is I want to approach, if you're willing, Mark, is this is okay if I approach the comorbidities that we're seeing in this condition? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So what we're seeing is, you know, 64% of the people who are coming in um, with, you know, some sort of illness that would be of concern have something called comorbidities or conditions that they had prior to contracting the actual coronavirus. And the things that seem to be progressing people towards, well, the most common ones are like hypertension, diabetes, fatty liver, uh, gastritis, right? So uh, gastric ulcer, which, you know, along with these, people are taking certain medications, but we won't talk about that. But the diseases themselves are being associated with adverse outcomes. Meaning if you are diagnosed previously and you have hypertension, if you have cardiovascular disease, if you have fatty liver, if you have diabetes, then, the likelihood of you progressing to a state of severity in this condition goes up. In fact, when you look at the mortality data, 100% of the people who die from this condition aren't dying from this condition alone. Mm -hmm. Meaning they had some sort of condition previously that left them more susceptible to adverse outcomes. So they're getting infected. These organisms travel, the, the virus, I'm gonna call them, or the virus travels into the lungs. The immune system responds to the virus. And how the immune system responds to the virus and how the body recuperates from that response determines if a person is totally fine or gets pneumonia, progresses to an acute respiratory response, and then boom, they end up dying. Now, what this is telling us is that if a person has an unstable environment to begin with in their own cells, they're more likely to pass. Mm -hmm. So our job as functional medicine practitioners is to stabilize cellular function. Mm -hmm. Our job is to get to the root cause of all diseases. Our job is to make sure that when a person's immune system responds, the immune system is relatively prepared to do that. It has all of the nutrient cofactors like zinc and vitamin A, vitamin D, whatever it needs to not only respond to the infection, but also turn off once that response is no longer necessary. So for example, there's something called T regulatory cells. Once your immune system starts launching an attack, then you want something to come out and regulate how much of an attack you have. And what we're seeing in certain populations with these comorbidities, for example, they don't have good regulation. They don't have good nutrient status. These people usually have insufficiencies of certain nutrients. So Mark, you found a particular nutrient that was uh, significant in this population. So you wanna speak to that? Talking about butyrate, Tom? Um, I'm talking about the potassium, the hypokalemia. Ah, yeah, let's do that one. So, so yes, there, there's some data that shows, especially uh, coming out of China, that the severity of the cases seem to have a correlation with having low potassium. 
And the lower the potassium, the sicker these patients were. And ironically, some of these comorbid conditions that we're seeing associated with people that get really ill, one of them is high blood pressure. And so it brings up the question is, is there a correlation between these high blood pressure patients and those having low K, low potassium? We know that uh, a lot of diets that are high in potassium, the DASH diet, DASH2 diet, uh, are helpful for systolic hypertension. And so it, it just begs the, the bigger overarching question is looking at the terrain that the patient lives in, as opposed to getting so focused on the bugs, what's going on in the field? You know, how healthy is the terrain, the field? And that's really, I think, where, where Tom and I want to focus is, is functional medicine's approach to a root cause and, and building resilience and, and having a terrain that's not going to be falling as easily. Uh, so yeah, this is an electrolyte that we're talking about. This is related to what you eat, uh, the quality of food that you eat, setting people up for severity of disease, being found in these studies coming out of China. Yeah, so that's, that's a beautiful point, right? If you are preparing for a storm, what do you do? You go to the grocery store and you stock up on food. You go ahead and you nail up your windows, right? You make sure that you have all the supplies necessary so when the storm comes, you're prepared. So why isn't everybody running out right now and trying to put stores in their cells? Why aren't they trying to gather all the nutrients like they are toilet paper off the store shelves and trying to say, do I have enough potassium at this time? Do I have enough magnesium? We know that's important. Do we have enough vitamin D? Have you been tested for nutrient deficiencies? Do you know what your current status is? Because we see in these populations, hypertension, diabetes, whatnot, there are associative nutrient deficiencies. There are associative problems that we can help you with. So our job as functional medicine practitioners is to make sure each and every one of your cells is performing perfectly. Mm -hmm. So we want to get you to that stage. And, you know, dietary approaches for stopping hypertension, for example, um, you know, this, this thing here, think about that for a second. It recommends lots of vegetables. It recommends lots of whole foods. It re recommends that you reduce refined oils, refined carbohydrate. It recommends that you increase your consumption of what you would say the rainbow, right, Mark? All the different colors of the rainbow, because we know not only do fruits and vegetables that have different pigments provide different vitamins and minerals, but they have antioxidant chemicals called polyphenols, for example, that are phenomenal at changing cellular function, protecting your cells from oxidative damage and stress. So here's what happens, right? These viruses come into your cells, your immune system responds, they have what's called a, a, a burst, right? A, 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 an attack against this virus. And in that attack, there's gonna be cell damage. And if you have enough antioxidants in your body, if you have enough nutrients like amino acids to repair your tissue, you can actually survive that, no problem. You go ahead and re repair and rebound. You come back, it's no problem. But if you're insufficient of particular nutrients, if you don't have enough antioxidants, then you can't do that. So it's no wonder right now there are three trials going on in China looking at intravenous vitamin C. And now the crew who's out there and the people who design some of these IV vitamin C studies have dealt with all sorts of different things, including Ebola before, and treating different viral outbreaks with antioxidants. So we don't know the results yet. Those are not published results of those trials, but we know that there were 50 tons of IV vitamin C sent over to China. We know that there are three current trials underway, and the doctors are really excited about the results, although they can't share those yet because they haven't been published. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that maybe this isn't a death sentence when somebody gets you know, this illness. Maybe this is a time for us as a society to look at who we are. Mm -hmm. Are we taking care of ourselves? Are we saying, if I've been smoking, now's the time to stop. If mm -hmm. I've been eating junk food, now's the time to increase my nutrient density and, and talk to a nutritionist about my diet. If I you know, have low energy or if I have elevated blood pressure, do I need to look at my magnesium insufficiency, my potassium insufficiency? Do I need to look at it? Do I have enough coins on Q10? 
how do you find these things out? You have to get tested. You have to talk to a nutritionist. You have to talk to a functional medicine practitioner. You have to make sure that you're ready, that you have stockpiled and you've put boards up on your windows. So when this storm rolls through your household or through your community, you're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in, in that same vein, you know, people don't think of stool testing as something in the same discussion of, of immune uh, in, in traditional circles. That's not the way I was necessarily trained. You, you did that if you thought somebody had a gastroenteritis or a prolonged diarrhea, but not necessarily looking at somebody's health and, and how healthy their terrain was overall for preventing disease. But we've got in functional medicine the ability to look at stool tests from a whole different perspective where we're not only looking at the results of getting enough fiber and how it can raise components in the stool that allow us to actually have an immune system that operates, but we can look at the, the actual immunology of what's going on there. And 70% of our immune system lives there. Why would that be there? Well, maybe that's because that's where the outside world meets us. You know, it's this long 25 foot tube that we have this, plus the colon in addition to that, that we have this interaction. And it can either be a good one or a really bad interaction. So when we, it's almost a cliche, but when we say we're giving people fiber, it's not just to avoid constipation. It's to promote these chemicals that literally help our immune system to work better at a very frontline primitive level. And so having the ability to assess what's going on metabolically with the microbiome, the critters, is huge. And, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I didn't know how to do that. I'd never heard of it. And so having this additional ability to assess a person's reactions to the foods they're eating or not eating is incredibly powerful with immune diseases like this. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is when you balance out your intestinal tract, you give your immune system a leg up. So when you have the proper bugs in your intestinal tract and those bugs are being fed exactly what they need to be fed, then you produce specific immune modulating substances, including short chain fatty acids like butyrate. And when you have those immune substances modulating your entire system, you can calm down an aggressive immune response. You can actually increase that, that what I was talking about, the Treg cells, through a change in your, your gut. So when your gut is calm, you can calm your immune system, which is fascinating. And we're now seeing ties with all these comorbidities like the diabetes and gut function, that's a no-brainer. We're seeing ties in the, you know, improving your gut function and hypertension. So by eating a proper diet, by looking at your fiber, by getting a gut analysis, as Dr. Holdhouse was saying, you can determine, you know, what is my next step? How can I stock my pantry and board up my windows, both through my diet and through testing and through, you know, possible supplementation to, you know, be prepared? I and you guys, you guys aren't necessarily saying this isn't like so many people are working from home, kids are home. So these are things that people can do in the privacy on their own home while they're you know, maintaining a social distance, right? We've got telemedicine we're offering. We've got stool kits we can just deliver to homes. There are supplements that people can order online. Um, I think that the message out there right now is stay in your home, don't go outside, don't talk to people and stress out, right? So in functional medicine, we focus on what we call personal lifestyle factors. So can you guys speak to maybe other types of lifestyle, of course, beyond the most important ones, which is focusing on gut health and honing in on your diet. What are other things people should be thinking about that the news isn't talking about? Yeah, I mean, um, Tom, I'll start with that. I, I'll take that. You know, sleep is huge. Uh, we know that cortisol levels, the stress hormone, is affected by adequate sleep. Not just are you unconscious or not, but are you getting quality, normal, optimal sleep architecture? You know, the, the REM sleep and all those things. It has to do with your immune function. Melatonin, which is a, a, a very key chemical in the brain, which has to do with sleep, come to find out has a lot to do with your immune system and immune yeah. function. And cancers we're seeing now too. So 
these, these things associated with sleep, like neurotransmitters, and his, his, which histamine is one, melatonin uh, hormones, the, these are incredibly related to adequate sleep. And then stress, you know, we, we don't really talk about the connecting the dots as often in, in traditional care. And, and what I love about functional care is that we're able to kind of look at the biochemistry behind when you have an emotional or psychological or even a physical stressor, what it does to the immune globulins, which are the first line of defense in your intestinal tract towards reaching out and saying, oh, I don't like you, Mr. Virus, grabbing on, and, and, and it gets evacuated immediately before it even gets taken into the body. But if you're low in those immune globulins from stress or inadequate sleep or a bad diet, you, you've got a real handicap as to vulnerability, and that's really what we're talking about. And then exercise. Exercise is amazing. One of the things we know besides making people less depressed and having a better quality of life is that it helps boost the immune system. Obviously, it does things for improving insulin uh, sensitivity, which is what happens when people lose their sensitivity to insulin with type 2 diabetes, and you develop high blood sugar. And we know a lot of the people with these comorbid problems that are dying of exposures to viruses like this have diabetes. So exercise, big deal. Again, the fiber story from what you're eating uh, has a big role in creating things that can actually affect that as well. So it's, it's the basic lifestyle things that we, we often give lip service to, and we don't really give people adequate tools as to what does that mean? What do I do today? What can I do today? Feeling panicked, watching the news, being isolated, not being at work, worrying about my kids, uh, that will mitigate my risk. You know, it's, gosh, Mark, I can't, I can't agree with you more when it comes to sleep. Um, you know, the circadian rhythm is fascinating, right? I mean, it's, it's the sleep-wake cycle. It's the dark light cycle. It's, it's whatever you want to call it. We actually have human genes that rely on us being in alignment with the daily light exposure. Mm -hmm. So we are meant to get out early in the day. We're meant to stay out in the day. We're meant to have no blue light past sunset and all these things affect melatonin levels and what we're finding is melatonin is one of the most potent antioxidants hormone modulating substances immune modulating substances on the planet we didn't even know before you know I'd, after diving into all sorts of different research on the gut on alzheimer's disease on autoimmunity melatonin keeps popping up everywhere right. and when you line yourself up with the light cycles you start your melatonin going up and your cortisol going down, meaning you rest really well at night and your cortisol levels shut off so you get deep sleep. And in that deep sleep, what happens? Rest, digest, repair, detox, all these incredible things that you need for proper nutrient status, immune status, detoxification, you have to sleep. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm working on right now at FMI is a sleep program. Mm -hmm. And we're going to incorporate that. We're gonna have group meetings and we're gonna to talk to people about how to address your hypertension, how to address your blood sugar issues, how to address some of these major things that people are dying from when they get this coronavirus. Mm -hmm. So you can reverse your diagnosis of hypertension, sometimes within days, if you look at some of the earlier studies, with just changing your diet and your lifestyle. You can reverse your diabetes over a number of weeks or months. So if you are in one of these classes right here, right now, and you are saying, oh my gosh, that's me, I'm at risk, I'm gonna run and hide, I wish I could say that's gonna be your solution for the long term. Right. But what I can say is being proactive is right here, right now, an option for you. And we have some solutions to get you where you wanna go. If you wanna be a person who's no longer diagnosed with type two diabetes, come see us. If you want to be a person who longer gets diagnosed with hypertension, come see us. There are solutions for that. And we're going to provide group education meetings and all sorts of things for you. Yeah, thanks, guys. This is a message that needs to be really shouted from the rooftops because not enough people in our country and really our world are, are hearing this important message. So 
Thank you so much. Um, we're excited. Um, <clears throat> Tom is going to be joining us, actually, boots on the ground in Idaho starting next week, seeing patients. Dr. Holthouse will shortly follow two weeks later, the first week of April, um, starting to see patients in um, our Meridian Clinic. Tom will be seeing patients out of both Boise and Meridian, and we're just beyond thrilled and honored to have you guys uh, joining our team and helping us here just preach this good news. So thank you so much to both of you, and thanks to everybody who joined us and listened today.